significant in the growth in Chicago and across the United States, if not around the world, of a movement known as the Black Muslims, a movement which is popularly believed to preach a doctrine of hatred for the white race and the ultimate supremacy of the Negro race. The headquarters of the Muslim movement is here in Chicago in the 5300 block of South Greenwood, and its leader now is known as Elijah Muhammad. He's in residence here. The most active person in the spreading of the black Muslim movement is Elijah Muhammad's second-in-command, who calls himself Malcolm X. And Malcolm X is our guest today on City Desk. Across the desk, our panelists this week are NBC newsmen Charles McCune, Floyd Calver, and Len O'Connor. And Mr. X, may I begin by asking you, if you will please, outline us the platform and policies of the Muslim organization. Well, the platform that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our religious leader, uh, stands upon is the platform of complete freedom, justice, and equality for the 20 million black people, that, uh, or so-called Negroes, here in America. And he teaches us that uh, because of the seriousness of the condition that our people now find themselves in, that it's uh, absolutely impossible to solve our problems uh, with means other than religion. And he teaches us that the religion of Islam is the only religion that will uh, instill within our people the incentive to stand on our own feet. And instead of trying to force ourselves upon whites or force ourselves into the white society or blame the white man for our predicament and, and constantly beg him for what he has, he says that the only way that we can uh, solve our problem is to unite together among ourselves, among our own kind, uh, clean ourselves up, rid ourselves of the evils that we've uh, become addicted to here in this society and try and uh, solve our problem ourselves. Then uh, I referred to the popular belief that the Muslims preach a hatred for the white race. You do not subscribe to this? Then? No, uh, I've never heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teach or preach hatred for anyone. He, he preaches hatred against evil, against drunkenness, against dope addiction, against poverty and against uh, having to beg for the things that a man is supposed to have. Uh, but I've never he uh, heard him teach us or any of his followers hatred toward any human being. Do you think that some of his followers possibly then have misinterpreted the word that they've heard and follow a practice of hatred for the white race? I don't think that any Muslim practices hatred toward anyone. Uh, we have businesses around the country that are uh, uh, patronized by whites and we have many businesses here in Chicago and our customers are white as well as our own kind and a white person can go into any of these places of business and he'll have to admit that he is uh, treated with more respect and he finds more dignity there than he will find among the so-called Negroes who profess to be teaching uh, love for everyone. You've met twice you've referred to, to the Negroes, uh, the so-called Negroes you, you find uh, some fault with this description, yes. I get it. Mr. Muhammad teaches us that uh, Negro is a term that was applied to us during slavery by the slave master. And to write it right today, it's a term that is used only to point out the descendant of slaves. It's never used for black people, period. Africans can come to this country. They aren't called Negroes. And if they are called Negroes, they resent it. So if Negro meant black, as we've been taught, it would be a term that would be applicable to or pliable to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but he says that it is something that means a slave or something who is, it means something uh, that has been left out of society, politically, economically, uh, educationally, and otherwise. Mm -hmm. You don't think of it as an anthropological term? Definitely. It's not an anthropological term. It's a slave term. And it was a term that was invented in America and was used by the slave makers, slave traders, and slave masters and attached to the property or the chattel uh, or merchandise that our people represented in that particular day. Mr. O'Connor. What is your real name? Malcolm. Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Have you been to court to establish the I don't. I, uh, I didn't have to go to court to be called Murphy or Jones or Smith. Excuse me for answering you this way. That's if all right. If a Chinese person were to say his name was Patrick Murphy, uh, you would look at him like he's insane because uh, Murphy is an Irish name uh, a European name or the name that uh, has a Caucasian or, or a white background and a yellow person. Chinese is a yellow man and uh, he has nothing to do or no connection whatsoever with the name Murphy. And if it doesn't look proper for a person who is yellow 
or Chinese would be walking around named Murphy or Jones or Johnson or Bunch or Powell, uh, I think it would be just as improper for a black person or the so-called Negro in this country, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, to walk around with these names. And therefore, he teaches us that during slavery, the same slave master who owned us uh, put his last name on us to denote that we were his property. So that when you see a Negro today who's named Johnson, if you go back in his history, you'll find that he was once his grandfather or one of his forefathers was owned by a white man who was named Johnson. His name is Bunch. His, his grandfather was owned by a I white man point. that was uh, named Bunch. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. My father got his last name from his grandfather, and his grandfather got it from his grandfather, who got it from the slave master. The real names of our people were destroyed well, during slavery. Any, was there any line, uh, any point in, in the uh, genealogy of your family when you did have to use the last name, and if so, what was it? The last name of my forefathers yeah. was taken from them when they were brought to America and made slaves. And then the name of the slave master was given, which we refuse. We reject that name today. You mean, you, mean to you won't even tell me what your father's supposed last name was or gifted last name was? I never acknowledge it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the, the status of Elijah Muhammad. First of all, is he ill? I spoke to him today. He is in better health than he has been. He's suffering from asthmatic bronchitis. Is that why he didn't attend your rally on last Tuesday? Uh, the only reason that he didn't attend was his uh, ill condition. And the weather here, especially on that particular day, was of such nature that it would have been almost insane for him to come. Well, now, did you hold that meeting last Tuesday because it coincided with the uh, general election, the primary election? I think if you study the history of Mr. Muhammad's work and religious work in this country, he's been, we've had our convention on February the 26th every year for, I think, the past 33 years. Well, now, while, while you don't uh, care to discuss your former name or the name that the slave master gave to your antecedents, uh, it is a matter of record that uh, Muhammad's last name was Poole, Elijah Poole. No, that's the name that his slave master gave to his uh, grandfather or great-grandfather, but that's not his name. Well, his mother and father thought when they called him Elijah Poole that that was his name. They right? didn't know any better. Well, if they didn't know any better or not, that, they thought that was his name. Yes, sir, but sir... So what I'm trying to find out is when did he cease to be Elijah Poole and get to be Elijah Muhammad? In 1931, I think it was, in Detroit, he was taught the true history of our people and made aware at that time that he was wearing an English name, and by not being an Englishman, he looked out of place. And uh, his teacher gave him the name that he's wearing today, Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad. All right, now when did he become what he purports to be in your literature, the son of Allah? I've never heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad referred to as the son the of Allah. The prophet of Allah. Okay. I've never heard him referred to as the prophet of Allah. What do you refer to him Messenger as? Messenger of Allah. All right, the messenger of Allah, and I appreciate the correction. Yes, I mean, he says that a prophet is somebody who predicts the future, and he's not predicting the future, whereas a messenger is someone who carries a message that has been given to him by one who authors that message. Well, now, who gave him the message, and to whom is it supposed to be delivered? Master W.F. Muhammad, the one who taught him, is the author of the message. He gave it to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which makes him the messenger. And he's to deliver that message of truth and righteousness to the 20 million American so-called Negroes, which means he's to teach us the truth, which will awaken us, and then show us how to live a life of righteousness, which will automatically qualify us for recognition as human beings by all other righteous human beings here on this earth. Well, now, one other question. Uh, with reference to what Mr. Herbert asked you a little bit ago, uh, you took a very moderate position of... Uh of wanting independence without having any hatred for the for the whites is that is, do I understand that correctly hatred is not involved in it whatsoever well I recall uh, in the recent plane crash I mean two or three years ago or less than that a charter flight on Air France uh, in which a group of people from Atlanta Georgia uh, were as they say in the uh, business uh, as they took off from uh, from Arley Field, and you were quoted at that time as expressing great gratification that this tragedy had occurred. Do you recall that? I recall it. What uh, did you it say? Was, Do you remember? Uh, the press mis 
misinterpreted it and misrepresented it. What did you say? They said that it was made at a Muslim meeting. It wasn't. It was made at a rally of Negroes, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, and otherwise in Los Angeles, who were rallying to protest the brutal shooting of uh, seven unarmed Negroes and what did you by say? heavily armed white policemen in the city of Los Angeles. And because we are a people who have been taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to never carry weapons of any kind, but to get on God's side and rely on God to fight our battles for us, uh, at the time that these brothers were shot down so brutally, I pointed out at the funeral of the brother who died that God would step in and take a hand in giving us some form of justice for the brutal killing of our brother. And when the plane crashed in France, uh, I pointed out to the crowd at this rally that this was an act of God showing his wrath or complete uh, resentment over the brutal uh, form of injustice that had been inflicted upon our poor unarmed brothers. Were you saying Sir, that or do Billy you believe Graham, that? At that time, Dr. Billy Graham was in a crusade in Chicago. And the press, your papers here in this city, uh, quoted Billy Graham of also saying that that pl uh, plane crash was an act of God. And if you take time to check the newspapers, I think that you'll find that this is correct. But no one thought that Billy Graham was so wrong when he attributed the crash of this plane to his God. But when we say that it come from our God, then we're looked upon as being, well, you know, no, outraged. I know, but you took the position that uh, this was a matter of satisfaction to you for an injustice that... done against you, and I think that that's a trifle severe. We did not think that it was a coincidence that 120 of, of the whites on this plane came from the state of Georgia, a state that has the worst record in history in the history of America for the mistreatment of black people uh, in this country. Worse than Mississippi? Uh, well, uh, they maybe are a little less... Uh, Mississippi is a little less hypocritical today than Georgia, but both of them are still practicing the same thing. Uh, now the, the whites in Georgia bite Negroes with a smile, whereas they used to bite them with a growl. But they're still being bitten, and we don't think that it is, that it is any worse to be bitten with a smile than it is to be bitten with a growl. Mr. Calvert. While we're on the subject of um, Mississippi, what is uh, your organization's position of what happened in Mississippi uh, in the past Such as months? what? Such as the uh, James Meredith incident and the enrollment of him in the university. Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants justice for <clears throat> every one of the 20 million so-called Negroes. And to just take one Negro and stick him in, in college uh, with, uh, with the aid of the six, I think it's six, uh, 15,000 troops and at a cost of $6,000, it's a disgrace. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a farce. It's hypocrisy. Because if it's right for uh, one Negro to be forced into that university, then every Negro in the state of Mississippi who is qualified has the same right to go to that university. And if the government is not uh, ready and willing to uh, enforce the right of every Negro in the state of Mississippi, then, uh, in my opinion, sir, it's only hypocrisy to pretend that uh, they are for justice uh, by pushing one Negro in and blowing it up all over the world to make it look like they're solving the problem when millions of black people in that state are still going to uh, segregated schools and getting an inferior education. Does your organization encourage members to uh, uh, attempt to enter schools that have been known as all white? Uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't discourage us from attending white schools, but he does say that uh, it is better for us to go to our own schools and after we have a thorough knowledge of ourselves, of our own kind, and uh, racial dignity has been uh, instilled within us, then we can go to anyone's school and we'll still retain our race pride, our racial dignity, and we will be able to avoid the subservient inferiority complex that most Negroes have or are, that is instilled within most Negroes who receive this sort of integrated education. Well, you have a private school operation operating here in Chicago, at least, and possibly elsewhere. Uh, and it's been a subject of controversy lately. Uh, what is the acceptance of people who come out of your private schools into uh, schools of higher learning? Yes, we have many uh, students who have graduated from the University of Islam on 54th and Greenwood that uh, are now attending other schools. In fact, just as an example, one of Mr. Muhammad's sons never attended any school in his life but the University of Islam. He later attended DePaul University. He also attended the University of Chicago, and at present he's attending He's attending Al-Azhar University in Cairo, one of the oldest Muslim schools in the world. <coughs> and his uh, daughter-in-law also, who went to school here, is attending uh, the University of Cairo. 
And then we have other students who have graduated that are attending other colleges and universities in this country. And in our school, we never have any delinquency problems. We never have any dropouts. We never have any uh, uh, disrespect for authority or disrespect for, for, for parents. We don't have any kind of juvenile delinquency. All of the things that the regular school system is complaining about, uh, the critics and the most severe critics of Mr. Muhammad have to, uh, has to admit that we, don't, we aren't plagued with those same problems in our own school. I have listened to uh, uh, your leader at least on one occasion in convention here. It was two years ago, and, and at that time he uh, advocated uh, the separate state proposition of uh, giving the uh, what you call the so-called American Negro a separate state in which to live to make their own way. Uh, would you explain that philosophy, please? And have you had any support for it from anybody uh, in official ranks? Your first question first. To my understanding, what Mr. Muhammad has said is, that he wants freedom, justice, and equality for the black people here in America, which you agree they don't have. If they did, you wouldn't have a race problem. And he says, if America cannot bring about freedom, justice, and equality for our people in this country, then America should allow us to leave. If we can't get along together, we should, allow, we should be allowed to, to depart and go someplace where we can set up housekeeping for ourselves. Then he says, if America doesn't want us to go back home among our own people, and at the same time, they want to keep us here. Since we can't stay here and get along together in peace, he says what America should do is separate part of the country and give us a section where we can live and give us everything we need to get our particular uh, section functioning independently, uh, support us for 25 years until we are able to function independently in a society of our own. And in this way, the problem will be solved. Mr. McCune, you say there's no juvenile delinquency. What uh, is the discipline that you Well, number one, excuse me, practice. sir. Uh, one of the first things that Mr. <clears throat> Muhammad teaches is you have to set an example if you want others to do right. And he teaches the grown-up Muslims to live a highly disciplined and a highly moral uh, life of high morals. And by the parents uh, displaying the highest of morals in front of the children at all times, automatically this sets a pattern or an example for the children. And in our schools, our children, the emphasis is, is placed upon the recognition of authority and uh, by the children recognizing authority and respecting authority uh, it's easy for anyone who is in authority to teach the child and discipline the child and make the child aware of the importance of living a life in accord with with the law even after he grows up how did you happen to join the muslim movement i was in prison uh, i was a very wayward criminal backward illiterate uneducated and whatever other negative uh, characteristics you can think of type of person until I heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And because of the impact that it had upon me in giving me a desire to reform myself and rehabilitate myself for the first time in my life and also being able to see the effect that it had upon others, this is what made me accept it. And plus, uh, prior to hearing what he teaches, I had no interest whatsoever in anything serious or any kind of educational pursuits. And I noticed that after being uh, exposed to the religious teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, immediately it instilled within me such a high degree of racial pride and racial dignity that I wanted to be somebody. And I realized that I couldn't be anybody by begging uh, the white man for what he had, but that I had to get out here and try and do something for myself or make something out of myself. What has been the growth of the Muslim movement? There are conflicting reports as to how many Muslims there are in the United States. Can you tell us? Well, most critics say that the dissatisfied follow Muhammad, that the unemployed and the oppressed follow Muhammad. And I think you'll agree, the sociologists, the economists, and other experts say that the masses of black people are dissatisfied, unemployed, oppressed, and fed up. So that he actually gets his support uh, at the mass level. But now you have other Negroes at the class level who pretend not to go for him because usually their job uh, has been given to them by the white man. They, are, they have positions to which they have been appointed, and they uh, think that the only way that they can protect their job is by pretending in, the front, in front of the white man that they don't go for Mr. Muhammad either. But you well, find how, how many Muslims do you level. say there are in, the, in numbers? I couldn't say. I've never heard him say, and he's the only one who would know. 500,000? I couldn't say. Uh, I think that uh, anyone who does say is not in a position to know, and anyone who knows wouldn't say. What do you think that uh, the Urban League and the uh, NAACP have accomplished for your people? What's your attitude Well, in their that? own way, they have been doing their best to bring about freedom, justice, and equality, and human dignity for the black people in this country. 
But today you have such a, uh, an intense degree of dissatisfaction and impatience existing among our people at the mass level that it is almost impossible to come to them with a program that's going to take another hundred years to solve their problem and they still be satisfied to wait. So that they have the Urban League and the NAACP has done a good job within their understanding. But today it takes uh, more uh, uh, immediate solutions. And the solution that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has is immediate. It's and more you think they're not moving fast enough? Well, they're moving as fast as they can. But that's not fast enough for the masses of black people. If a person is sitting on a warm stove and you get ready to let him up, no matter how slow you are, he has patience because he, it's only warm. But the masses of black people who are sitting on a hot stove, they're impatient. And no matter how fast you say progress is being made toward letting them up, that progress is not fast enough for them. Well, the NAACP and the Urban League have both been critical of the, of the Muslims. The NAACP and Urban League have been maneuvered into criticizing us against their own will. Usually, the, the divide and conquer tactics have always been used by the oppressor to keep the oppressed oppressed. And the NAACP has been used against the Muslims. Efforts have been made to use us against them. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says he'll work with the NAACP, the Urban League, and any other Negro organization that wants to uplift the black man as long as it doesn't conflict with our religious principles. Well, I remember once when Elijah was quoted as having said that the Urban League and the NAACP sold out to the white man. Has he ever made that statement uh, to To you? my knowledge, I don't think that he has said that uh, they sold out to the white man. I've heard him say that. Is that his feeling? Uh, uh, the, the NAACP has been in existence for 54 years and, for, and they, they elect a new national president every year and they have never elected a black man to sit in that capacity. Arthur Spingarn has been president of the NAACP for 24 years and so in this sense it means that either they're practicing discrim the same discrimination that they accuse the white man of practicing, they're practicing it themselves or else they're not qualifying other Negroes in that organization for the positions of leadership. This is our only criticism. Do you personally feel that they have sold out to the white man? Those organ Do you personally feel that those organizations have sold out to the white man? I don't think that uh, they would knowingly allow themselves to be used or misused against their own people. So if they are failing to do the job that, their pe that our people are expect of them, probably it's just through lack of understanding. But today their understanding is increasing and you'll find that they're developing a, a better ability to work with all different factions for the betterment of our people. Uh, Malcolm, how do you yourself feel about the white man? I believe that the white man has done a great injustice to the black man in this country mm -hmm. by having kidnapped our people and, uh, and brought us here and down to the level that we're on today. And today, instead of approaching the factors that their uh, or original mistake has created, instead of approaching these factors objectively and realistically, the greatest sin that they're doing now is trying, by, is trying to pretend that they never committed a crime, that they never did any wrong. And when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad points out the injustices that our people are suffering, this, they, they, they uh, make that sin worse by accusing him of teaching hate or by accusing him of, of uh, black supremacy or by accusing him of advocating violence simply because he is pointing out the we, real we, factors we, we in the problem. We have a little time left. You don't have to hurry so much. No, I don't. You were born in Omaha, is that right? Yes, sir. And you left, your family left Omaha when you were what, one year old? I imagine about a year old. And why did they leave Omaha? Well, to my understanding, uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, burned down one of their homes in, uh, in, uh, in Omaha. This, they had a lot of Ku Klux This made your family feel very unhappy, I'm sure. Well, insecure, if not unhappy. So you must have a somewhat prejudiced point of view, a personally prejudiced point of view. In other words, you cannot look at this in a broad, academic sort of way, really. I, I, I think that's incorrect, because uh, despite the fact that that happened in Omaha, and then when we moved to Lansing, Michigan, our home was burned down again. In fact, my father was killed by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and despite all of that, no one was more thoroughly integrated with whites than I. No one has lived more so in the society of whites than I. And uh, it was only until I became a Muslim that I ceased living in the society you say of you are thoroughly integrated with the whites oh, yes. are, do you have white people in your family background definitely most negroes in this country have whites in their family background how, because how are you going to differentiate between the white blood that's in you and the negro blood that's in you and you don't mind my using no the negro, but well, did you use this yourself i use it interchangeably i know you do uh, why do you do that well i use it uh if it fits the purpose to use it but i use it against my will uh, but you, use use it against it, you, my, you use it uh, voluntarily in describing the incident in Los Angeles. Still, you, I use it against my will. I guess the teachings weren't <laughs> thoroughly inculcated. No, uh, but when I say to you that the uh, cops in Los Angeles shot down seven unarmed Negroes, mm -hmm. every Negro in the audience knows what I'm talking about. But when I say that he shot, that they shot 
uh, seven uh, Muslims, then a lot of the Negroes don't realize that you're you talking about Negroes. suppose you said seven people, because you say you use the term colored people. You said... I don't think I use the word colored. colored on this program. Yes, you did. You did when we started Not colored. Out. I think so. Black people, I'm sorry. You black. Didn't say black. Well, we can use black, and that fits everything. <laughs> okay. But certainly black. Now, let me get back to another point that you made. You said that uh, you go back home. Now, what do you mean by back home? I've only heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say, back among our own people. From you when said we... back home. You yes. don't mind my saying Right, that. back home. But by that do you, you mean... Do you mean back into uh, the uh, roots of, is of uh, Islam, or do you mean back to Africa? Back home. And Africa. by back home, he means back into our original uh, civilization. And if you study history, the Islamic culture existed in West Africa, But your Central family Africa. didn't come from uh, an Isla Islamic background originally, did it? I mean, you came from from the proud tribes of Africa, which I think you find, sir, that one of the, background. that Islam, the Islamic culture, a, which, I agree, there is, a, existed a widely of, in Africa, Central well, Africa, agree, West Africa. I agree, I've met many people in there. Mr. O'Connor. With regard to that uh, tragedy yeah. out there in Los Angeles, uh, I myself refer to it when it happened as the tragic police action, so I am not totally biased. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming from... Uh, Muhammad Speaks, which is the publication of your, uh, your cult or your religion. Uh, Elijah Poole, Elijah Muhammad, uh, referred to the policemen out there, the white policemen, as devils. Uh, he said, there is no justice here for us black people. There is no future for us nor our children in civilized America. Uh, doesn't that uh, imply that you're going to get out, or that's his wish that you get out? If he referred to those policemen out there as devils, who had, who were heavily armed and knew that the men, the Negroes, whom they were shooting down in cold blood, were not heavily armed, I don't think that those policemen themselves would deny that they're devils. Nor would any Negro who witnessed such a deed deny that they are devils. Well, about the other part of it, there's no justice here for us black people. There's no future for us, nor our children in civilized America. And I didn't make that up. He, he said it in his own... And he's correct in what he says, sir. Well, what does it mean? Does uh, it mean you're going to get out or It what? means the same thing that Attorney General Robert Kennedy uh, means when he says that the number one domestic problem in America is the race problem. That it is almost impossible to solve it. It's almost impossible to give justice to Negroes. One brief thing uh, further. I read also in Mohammed Speaks the quotation that, that uh, Elijah Mohammed is the only uh, person on earth who is, the personal, who is on personal speaking terms with God. Do you believe that? Definitely. You do? Definitely. We're going to have to leave it at that. And Malcolm, I'm sure he's done a good job in rehabilitating you. It was a pleasure to have you on City Desk. Brothers and sisters, we are known for having the most peaceful meeting of any large group of people. We were involved in an altercation with L.A. police that led to police opening fire, killing one nation member named Ronald Stokes, and seriously wounding several others. The black community in Los Angeles was outraged and forged a broad-based coalition of support of the victims of the shooting. Malcolm flew out to California to speak, and a good portion of that speech was recorded. Now, we want to show you as much of Malcolm's speech as possible. There are several jumps in the train of thought because of camera stops. We hope that you do not find this too distracting. We also hope that you'll notice how relevant Malcolm's comments are to what's going on today, despite the fact that he made them 28 years ago. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, to whom all praise is due, whom we forever thank for giving us the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as our leader, teacher, and guide. And I specifically, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and brothers and sisters, uh, open up like that because I am a representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And were it not for him, you and I wouldn't be here today. In order for you and me to devise some kind of method or strategy to offset some of the events or re a repetition of the events that have taken place here in Los Angeles recently, we have to go to the root. We have to go to the cause. Dealing with the condition itself is not enough. We have to get to the cause of it all or the root of it all. And it is because of our effort 
toward getting straight to the root that people oftentimes think we are dealing in hate. But first, I would like to congratulate and give praise to the Negro, so-called Negro leaders and so-called Negro organizations. And excuse me if I say so-called, it's hard for me to just outright say Negro when I know what that word Negro really means. <laughs> The person whom you have come to know as Ronald Stokes, we know him as Brother Ronald. One of the most religious persons who displayed the highest form of morals of any black person anywhere on this earth. And as one of the previous speakers pointed out who knew him, everyone who knew him had to give him credit for being a good man, a clean man, an intelligent man an, uh, and an innocent man when he was murdered. The Negro, so-called Negro organizations and, and, uh, and uh, leaders should be given great credit for their failure or refusal to let the white man divide them and use them one against the other during this crisis. As Reverend Welford Wilson pointed out, I think it was eight years ago today that the Supreme Court handed down the desegregation decision. And despite the fact that eight years have gone past, that decision hasn't been implemented yet. I don't have that much faith I don't have that much confidence, I don't have that much patience, and I don't have that much ignorance to... <laughs> if the Supreme Court, which is the highest law-making body in the country, can pass a decision that can't get even 8% compliance within eight years because it's for black people, then my patience has run out. When black people who are being oppressed become impatient, they say that's emotional. Please, when black people who are being deprived of their citizenship, not only of their civil rights, but their human rights, become impatient, become fed up, don't want to wait any longer, then they say that's emotional. <laughs> the Negro, so-called Negro leaders and organizations should be praised. They should be congratulated. They should be complimented because out of all of them combined, the white man has not yet found one who will play the role of Uncle Tom. But yet he has found no Tom, no puppet, no parrot who is still dumb enough in 1962 to represent the injustices that he's afflicting against our people. We don't care what your religion is. We don't care what organization you belong to. We don't care how far in school you went or didn't go. We don't care what kind of job you have. We have to give you credit for shocking the white man by not letting him divide you and use you one against the other. In the past, the greatest weapon the white man has had has been his ability to divide and conquer. As Jackie Robinson pointed out beautifully on the television last night, four-fifths of the world 
isn't white. Isn't that what Jackie said? <laughs> and if, if four-fifths of the world is dark, how is it possible for one-fifth to rule, oppress, exploit, dominate, and brutalize the four-fifths who are in the majority? Good question. How do they do it? Divide and conquer. If I take my hand and slap you, you don't even feel it. It might sting you because these digits are separated. But all I have to do to put you back in your place is bring those digits together. <laughs> this is what the white man has done to you and me. He has divided us and used us one against the other. But today, thanks to Allah, you can say thanks to God or thanks to Jesus or thanks to Jehovah, whatever you want. But as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we have been taught to say thanks to Allah. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus called on Allah. He said, Allah, Allah, Lama Asabakini. I believe what's, what's good for Jesus is good for you. If Allah was good enough for Jesus to call upon, I think he should be good enough for you to call upon. Since the so-called Negro community has shot the white man by resisting all efforts to divide us, I think that you and I should continue to shock him by staying and working together in unity. Despite religious, political, economic, or educational, or social differences, let us remember that we are not brutalized because we're Baptists. We're not brutalized because we're Methodists. We're not brutalized because we're Muslims. We're not brutalized because we're Catholic. We're brutalized because we are black people in America. <laughs> Hey, your mother is being raped, and you're not supposed to be em emotional. Your women, please, your women can't walk the street without some cracker putting his hands on her, and you're not supposed to be emotional. <laughs> if you say that you're fed up, if you teach the Negro, they don't even know their own name. Why? Because he took it away from them. Please, please. 20 million black people don't even know their own language. Why? Because he took it away from them. 20 million black people who don't even know the history of their ancestors. Why? Because he took it away from them. And if you try and tell them how thoroughly and completely they've been robbed, he says you're teaching hate. <laughs> That's something to think about. Today you are coming out of college. You are coming out of the leading universities. You are trying to go in a good direction. But you don't know which direction to go in. And if somebody tries to take you right to the root of your problem, they say that that man's a hate teacher. If I, if I ask why should the senators in Washington... And then again, if we tell you that Negroes are being hung on the tree, or being shot down illegally, unjustly. And those Negroes should do something to protect themselves, you say you're advocating violence. The white man is tricking you. He's trapping you. He doesn't call it violence when he lands troops in South Vietnam. And please, please, please. He doesn't call it violence when he lands troops in Berlin. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he didn't say get nonviolent. He said, praise the Lord, but pass the ammunition. <laughs> but when someone attacks you, when someone comes at you with a club, when someone comes at you with a rope, when someone comes at you with a gun, despite the fact that you've done nothing. He tells you, suffer peacefully. Pray for 
of those who use you despitefully. Be long suffering. And how long can you suffer after suffering for 400 years? So I just want to clear up that little point right there. Because he says that we play on your emotions. And when you turn on your television tonight, or your radio, or read the newspaper, they're going to tell you in that paper that I was playing on your emotions. Imagine you, a second-class citizen. That's not getting emotional, it's getting intelligent. <laughs> and as far as your, your mayor is concerned, I see you should say their mayor. A man named Yorty, who has been slandering the Muslims, a professional liar, a professional liar. Who has mastered the art of using half-truths. Put it in the paper that they broke into our religious uh, place of worship and got records that they can use to prove that most of us have criminal records. You can't be a Negro in America and not have a criminal record. <laughs> Martin Luther King has been to jail. Please. James Farmer has been to jail. Why, you can't name a black man in this country who is sick and tired of the hell that he's catching who hasn't been to jail. <laughs> him with being seditious. They put Moses in jail. They put Daniel in jail. Why, you haven't got a man of God in the Bible that wasn't put to jail when they started speaking out against exploitation and oppression. They charged Jesus with sedition. Didn't, didn't they do that? They said he was against Caesar. They said he was discriminating because he told his, his disciples, go not the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep. He discriminated. Don't go near the Gentiles. Go to the lost sheep. Go to the oppressed. Go to the downtrodden. Go to the exploited. Go to the people who don't know who they are, who are lost from the knowledge of themselves, and who are strangers in a land that is not theirs. Go to those people. Go to the slaves. Go to the second-class citizens. Go to the ones who are suffering the brunt of Caesar's brutality. And if Jesus were here in America today, he wouldn't be going to the white man. The white man is the oppressor. He would be going to the oppressed. He would be going to the humble. He would be going to the lowly. He would be going to the rejected and the despised he would be going to the so-called American Negro. <laughs> to, be a, to, have, to have once been a criminal is no disgrace. To remain a criminal is the disgrace. I, I formerly was a criminal. I formerly was in prison. I'm not uh, ashamed of that. You never can use that over my head. And that he's using the wrong stick. I don't feel that stick. <laughs> I went to prison because I believed in men like Sam Yardy. I went to prison because I trusted men like Sam Yardy. I went to prison following the philosophy of men like Sam Yardy. But since I've been following the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I have been reformed, and that's more, please, that's more than Sam Yardy and Chief Parker and all these other white politicians have been able to do with the inmates in the prisons of this state. They should give Mr. Muhammad credit. They should give Mr. Muhammad credit for reforming and rehabilitating men whom they have failed to reform and rehabilitate. Refer to the, some 
press report that Mr. Muhammad had once been found guilty of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. He failed to explain purposely that in 1934, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad refused to send his children to the white schools in Detroit, Michigan, that were teaching you about little black Sambo. That's the, that's, the, that's the minor that he contributed to the delinquency of. You see, this vicious, fork-tongued white man has been able to take lies and make you turn against those who want to help you and make others turn against you. This is the contributing to the delinquency of a minor that this mayor, or man who calls himself mayor, is talking about. In the same article, he said that the Muslims are the same people who rioted in the United Nations. Someone should pull his coat and let him know that at the present moment, there are six million dollars worth of suits le leveled against two of New York's leading newspapers for making the mistake of charging the Muslims as being involved in those United Nations riots. We were not involved. And if this fork-tongued man who calls himself your mayor had taken the time to find that out, he wouldn't be walking into the trap that he's letting his ignorance lead him into. And if you take, if you take the time to read the uh, Washington Post that came out the Sunday after that incident took place, the Washington Post pointed out on the front page that the Muslims had nothing to do with the UN riots. And they quoted, in saying so, uh, the, the person who was at that time the commissioner of police in New York City. See, it's lies that the white man has spread about the Muslims to try and make you afraid of the Muslims or to try and make you think that the Muslims were a criminal element, uh, uh, an uncouth element, and things that you would not like to be associated with. Also, they say that, they, I'm just clearing these things up and then we're going to get into what happened. They also say that uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a draft dodger. No, he wasn't. He just refused to go to the army because he was a man of peace. He was a minister of a religion of peace. He was teaching peace. So he outright refused to go to the army. That's not draft dodging. That's intelligence. Here, before the grand jury, because the coroner's jury is stacked against Negroes. The grand jury is stacked against Negroes. The press, the radio, the television, and the newspapers are stacked against Negroes. But please, the Los Angeles Police Department is stacked against Negroes. He is stacked against all Negroes, all except those whom he has appointed to high positions. The, contr the controlled press, the white press, inflames the white public against Negroes. It, the police are able to use it to paint the Negro community as a criminal element. The police are able to use the press to make the white public think that 90% or 99% of the Negroes in the Negro community are criminals. And once the white public is convinced that most of the Negro community is a criminal element, then this automatically paves the way for the police to move into the Negro community exercising Gestapo tactics, stopping any black man who is in the, on, on the sidewalk, whether he is guilty or whether he is innocent, whether he is well-dressed or whether he is poorly dressed, whether he is educated or whether he is dumb, whether he's a Christian or whether he's a Muslim, as long as he is black and a member of the Negro community, the white public thinks that the white policeman is justified in going in there and trampling on that man's civil rights and on that man's human rights. Once the police have convinced the white public 
that the so-called Negro community is a criminal element, they can go in and question, brutalize, murder unarmed, innocent Negroes, and the white public is gullible enough to back them up. This makes the Negro community a police state. This makes the Negro neighborhood a police state. It's the, it's the most heavily patrolled. It has more police in it than any other neighborhood, yet it has more crime in it than any other neighborhood. How can you have more cops and more crime? Why? It shows you that the cops must be in cahoots with the criminal. Of the, of the hair that God pleased, that God gave them, so much that they'll put lie on it? <laughs> Do you realize now, you know, brother, lie will eat a hole in steel, and you know your head is not that hard. <laughs> Who taught you, please? Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate, you should ask who yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you. <laughs> we teach you to love the hair that God gave you. Here you way out in the middle of the ocean, can't swim, and you worried about someone that's in the bathtub and can't swim. We don't steal, we don't gamble, we don't lie, and we don't cheat. And that also deprives the government of revenue. Because you can't get into a whiskey bottle without getting past the government seal. You can't open a deck of cars without getting past the government seal. There's a white man makes the whiskey and then puts you in jail for getting drunk. He sells you the cards and the dice and puts you in jail when he gets you using them. So he's against us because we fix it where he can't catch you anymore. We take the dice out of your hands and the cards out of your hands and the whiskey out of your head. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected one, a person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And as Muslims, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us to respect our women and to protect our women. And then the only time a Muslim really gets real violent is when someone goes to molest his woman. We will kill you for our woman. I'm, I'm making it plain, yes. We will kill you for our woman. We believe that if the white man will do whatever is necessary to see that his woman gets respect and protection, then you and I will never be recognized as men until we stand up like men and place the same penalty over the head of anyone who puts his filthy hands out to put in the direction of our women. We respect them, but we want them to respect us. We think that the law should respect the Negro community. The law should protect the Negro community. 
the law should approach the Negro community with intelligence if it expects the Negro community to react intelligently. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us to always avoid anything that smacks of disrespect for the law. And if the police department tells the truth, they will have to admit that they have never had any uh, experiences with Muslims that have ever been anything other than honorable unless they themselves come at us in a dishonorable way. It has no case against the Muslims. It has no case against these brothers whom they shot down. And because it has no case, it's trying to create a case. It's trying to manufacture a case. And therefore, they set up a grand jury hearing of the case so that they could hear it behind closed doors. And after hearing what we have to say, then build their particular strategy or defense against the actions that they committed on that uh, April the 27th. So at the advice of our attorneys, we purposely, the victims, those who have been indicted, or rather those who are, have been arrested and are out on bond, have purposely refrained and refused from making any statement whatsoever until after the case appears in court. And when you hear their story, it will be in a public trial. We have already been had experience with these private hearings behind closed doors. Anything that the white man has to do to the Muslim, he has to do it in the open. He has to do it in public. Or he has to put every single one of us behind bars for the rest of our lives. When Mayor Yardy called for a government investigation of a religious group that has the highest moral standard of any group in the Negro community, Mayor Yardy was giving you an example of what Hitler did in Nazi Germany when he began to go on the rampage. <laughs> we feel, we have confidence that the white public and the black public, if they hear our case, if they hear and have access to the investigation, will never be fooled by this phony setup that stacked from the top all the way down. And if you doubt it, when you leave home tonight, when you go home tonight, look for the press. I'd like at this time to call forth these brothers who are under, uh, who were arrested. The brothers who were arrested. Come up here behind these chairs, please. They were suspects. This wouldn't happen in a white neighborhood. White man can walk down the street with packages on his head, packages under his arm, and packages everywhere else. And won't anybody question his right to carry those packages. But a Negro is suspect because the press makes you suspect. Yes, the white press makes Negro suspect. What do you got? all the information you need, officer. And the officer made one stay at the rear of the car and the other go to the front of the car. And while he was taking the one to the front of the car, the polite attitude, the humble air, the submissive, intelligent, peaceful spirit that he unexpectedly found in this Negro infuriated him. And he began to, he, he told the brother, put down your hand. Brother was talking, he's not a criminal. A man has a right on the sidewalk to talk with his hands. Put down your hand, don't talk with your hands. And when the brother continued to gesture with his hands, the officer grabbed his hand, twisted it around, ground behind his back, flung him up against the car, and then that's when hell broke loose. That was when hell broke loose. A struggle ensued. Shots were fired by the police and by a Negro door shaker. <laughs> a 
an alarm went up. When the alarm went out, instead of the police going to the place where the incident occurred, the police went one block away to the temple. When they arrived there, they got out of their cars with their guns smoking. You would have thought it was Wyatt, what is his name? Wyatt Earp. I'm telling you, they came out of those cars and we have enough witnesses to hang them with their guns smoking. Chief Parker knows this, Mayor Yardy knows this, and every police official in the city knows that. They didn't fire no warning shots in the air. They fired warning shots point blank at innocent, unarmed, defenseless Negroes. As I say, two of the brothers were shot in the back. Another was shot in the shoulder. Another was shot, two of them were shot, excuse the expression, through the penis. Another was shot in the hip, and the bullet came out the other side. Brother Arthur here was shot one quarter of an inch from his heart. Let me tell you something, and I'll tell you why you say we hate white people. We don't hate anybody. We love our own people so much, they think we hate the ones who are inflicting injustice against them. who has been shot, the bullet having passed a quarter of an inch through his heart. I'm not going to let him talk, which I think you can understand why. You should listen to the conversation of the police officers while it was going on. Two of the brothers who had been shot were lying hand in hand. The officers said they were chanting a, a, a death chant. You read that. They were saying, Allah Akbar. What does that mean? It means that God is the greatest. It means that God is the greatest. Understand, this that the white officer called a death chant was a prayer. They were praying when they were shot down. They were saying, Allah Akbar. And it, it shook the officer up because they haven't heard black people talk any kind of talk but what they taught them. And two of the brothers who were shot in the back were telling me that they were, as they lay on the sidewalk, they were holding hands. They held hands with each other, saying, Allahu Akbar. And the blood was seeping out of them where the book, police bullet had torn into their inside. Still they said, Allahu Akbar. And the police came and kicked them in the head. What fun? Police kicked him in the head, telling him to shut up that noise. While they were laying on the sidewalk in front of our temple. Kicked him in the head. Shut up that noise. And one of them, when he was on his way to the uh, uh, police station in the ambulance, one of the uh, uh, ambulance attendants told the white cop, why don't you kill the nigger? He said, I'll tell, him, I'll, tell, I'll tell him that he tried to get away. Why don't you kill the nigger? Why don't you got a chance? And I'll, 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 I'll swear that he tried to get away. If he didn't say this, then I need to be put in jail, and I'll gladly go. One of them who was being taken to jail in a police car. As the ambulance sirens were coming to the place, one of the policemen said to the other, what are the ambulances rushing for? Nothing but some niggas. So he looked in and saw the Muslim brother sitting beside him, and he said, and he shut up. But after he got to the jail, the same officer that said this turned to the brother and said, I hope that you didn't get offended by what I said back there under the heat of emotion because some of my best friends are colored. <laughs> this is what he said. That's his password. Some of my best friends are colored. <laughs> and I, for one, as a Muslim, believe that the white man is intelligent enough 
if he were made to realize how black people really feel and how fed up we are without that old compromising sweet talk. Why, you're the one that make it hard for yourself. The white man believes you when you go to him with that old sweet talk because you've been sweet talking to him ever since he brought you here. Stop sweet talking. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how, what kind of hell you've been catching and let him know that if he's not ready to clean his house up, if he's not ready to clean his house up, he shouldn't have a house. It should catch on fire and burn down. As Muslims, we identify ourselves with the dark world. So we're not any minority. We're a part of the majority, and the white man is the minority. You have to know this to understand us. We don't think any odds are against us. We don't fight a battle like the odds are against us. Why, the whole dark world today is in unity. It's one. If you don't th think so, look at the United Nations. When the dark world votes, they vote as one. They're getting the colonialists, colonialists out of Africa and out of Asia, telling them to get out. They don't have any nuclear weapons, but they got a solid united voice, and their unity alone is sufficient to drive the oppressor and exploiter of their people out of their own country. You and I need to learn a lesson from that right there. The, uh, in the UN, the dark world consists of Buddhists, Hindus, Shintoists, Taoists, Christians, Muslims, everything. But they're together. They forget their religious and political differences. They think as one. They move as one against a common enemy. And right out of uh, Algeria, he's going. Don't think he's not going. He's going. They're getting him out of Angola, out of Tanganyika, out of Angola, out of uh, uh, Uganda, out of Kenya. He's going from South Africa too. He hasn't got long to be there. All over this earth, got people who have been oppressed and exploited by those who are not their own kind, strangers, are coming together to get the oppressor off their back. You and I learn a lesson from that. We are oppressed. We are exploited. We are downtrodden. We are denied not only civil rights, but even human rights. So the only way we're going to get some of this oppression and exploitation uh, away from us or aside from us is come together against the common enemy. <laughs> when they sat down at the Bandung conference, everyone there had this in common, a dark skin. Some of the, those who were sitting there were socialists, some were communists, some were capitalists, some were Christians, some were Buddhists. They were everything. But all of them were dark skin. And they looked at that dark skin and agreed that this is one thing they had in common. Forget that you're a Methodist. Forget that you're a Catholic. Forget that you're a Protestant. Forget that you're a Muslim. Remember that all of us are black and we're catching hell. For transcripts, send $4 to Like It Is Transcripts, Journal Graphics, 267 Broadway, New York, 10007, or call 212-227-READ. Rush service is available. Who is the black man? The black man in the West has ceased to be black, uh, not of his own volition, but he ha he's actually been stripped of his blackness. He he has been stripped of the language of the black man. He couldn't speak the language of his own people. He had to speak the language of strangers. And today, he speaks the language of strangers. He knows nothing about, his, about the indigenous language of his people uh, prior to being brought into the Western Hemisphere. He has been stripped of the black man's name. He has been stripped of the black man's culture. And uh, actually also stripped of the black man's history. And just as a tree, without roots, dies and becomes dead, uh, when a people becomes stripped of their history or their historic roots, they also become a dead people. 
And for this reason, the condition of the black man in the Western Hemisphere has been that of a dead man. And this dead thing was also dehumanized. The slave masters robbed us of everything that we could use to prove that we were a part of the human family, the black family. And this is the condition that our people in the West are in today. The struggle in the states between the races has always been bloody, but it has been one-sided. The Negro has been doing most of the bleeding, but I believe he's beginning to feel that bleeding should be reciprocal. Uh, it should be done equally on both sides. Everybody should bleed. If, if, if the Negro is going to bleed, everybody should bleed. And I think he's beginning to see this. But it should be equalized. The struggle of the colored peoples of the world against the forces of Western imperialism and its agents has been going on for a long time. On the continents of North and South America, in Asia, in Africa, oppressed peoples have been waging a tireless campaign against domination at the hands of imperialists and their insane doctrine of racial supremacy. But at the very moment when the last outpost of colonialist barbarians seem most comfortable, at the very moment when representatives of the self-styled master race feel most secure and certain of continuing their vicious schemes of enslavement, our people are affirming their humanity. We are demanding an end to centuries of exploitation. We are proving that imperialism, far from being invincible, is now on its last leg. Indeed, Throughout the world, the colored peoples are mobilizing and uniting their ranks to intensify and to speed up the certain death of colonialism and neo-colonialism. We are preparing ourselves for the final showdown with the well-known enemies of human rights and human dignity. Today, intimidation through fear and the reign of the Ku Klux Klan is facing destruction. And what is the actual situation in the United States, where over 20 million colored people virtually live as a colonized nation under racist and economic oppression? Well, for the past 10 years, the struggle in America has been confined to what has been projected to the public as a civil rights struggle. And uh, in that context, it has remained a domestic problem. It has remained within the jurisdiction of the United States. And it has, and as such, it has been impossible for the Afro-Americans or American Negroes to try and enlist the support of other dark-skinned uh, people who are being oppressed the world over in, in that struggle. And the difference now uh, in the direction that the uh, struggle is taking from that, from the direction that the struggle has been going in in the past, there are many uh, of our people who are thinking more deeply and more broadly and are beginning to see the importance of lifting it uh, out of the national context or out of the domestic context or beyond the jurisdiction of the United States government. And the only way this can be done is by internationalizing the problem and, and putting it uh, at a level where it can be taken into the United Nations and then all of the other independent nations on this earth can involve themselves in our struggle and support us. And, uh, the only way by this, of which this can be done, instead of it being called civil rights in the future, we're going to have to label it a human rights struggle or the struggle for human rights. And as such, we can then take it into the United Nations uh, through the avenues that have been set up by the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we can take the, our problem before the United Nations in the same uh, manner that the problem of South Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Hungary, the Arab refugee problem. It, it becomes a world problem. And as a world problem, then the uh, uh, Afro-American or the so-called Negroes have more of a chance of getting some real meaningful results 
because uh, it's not left up to the one who's responsible for it anymore, but it's, 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 it's uh, put at a level where the whole world can see that our plight is wrong, and they can bring the moral support of the entire world on our side against this force that has stood in our path in the, in the uh, past. It also makes a difference in the leadership. Those who have been posing as leaders of our people uh, in America in the past, won't, they can pose on this local stage where Uncle Sam is the master of the show and can prop them up and make them look good or make them look better than they actually are by giving them token gains and building them up uh, an image. But when, you, when they step onto the international stage or the world stage, then Uncle Sam can't prop them up anymore. And their ability or lack of ability becomes exposed and if they can lead us forward, they remain leaders. But if they can't, then they have to step aside and more qualified and bona fide leaders step up from the masses of our people and then we get more, uh, we get faster progress. We get more results. Malcolm X came from the masses as a genuine leader of his people. He was well aware of the false divisions planted between them. For he himself had overcome many of these artificial barriers to emerge as a voice which raised our strongest demands for freedom and justice in America. This man combined his recognition of the chief enemy of the African and Afro-American people with an objective knowledge of where our strength lay. He talks about the black intellectual, he talks about education, revolutionary education, he talks about the tasks of our women. Well, in the past, the, the uh, Afro-American or American Negro intellectual uh, perhaps uh, per permitted himself to be used in a way that wasn't really beneficial to the overall uh, Afro-American struggle. But I think today that these, I think today these uh, intellectuals have begun to uh, undertake a new appraisal of the problem, uh, looking at it as it actually is, and are beginning to see it more in the international context and the relation that it has with the African uh, struggle. And the African intellectual is beginning to look at the problem uh, in the African context and see that what might be good in one country uh, in order for it to be used in another country has to be rearranged. You take African socialism. Many of the a African intellectuals that have analyzed the uh, approach of socialism are beginning to see where the African has to use a form of socialism that... Uh, uh, that fits into the African context, whereas uh, the form that is used in a European country might be good for that particular European country, it doesn't fit as well into the African context. So I think the African intellectual is making that contribution and he's making it well. One thing that I uh, became aware of in my traveling recently through Africa and the Middle East, in every country that you go to, uh, usually the degree of progress can never be separated uh, from the woman. If you're in a country that's progressive, the woman is progressive. If you're in a country that reflects the consciousness uh, toward the importance of education, it's because the woman is aware of the importance of education. But in every backward country, you'll find the women are backward. And in every country where education is not stressed, it's because the women don't have education. So one of the things I became thoroughly convinced of in my recent travels is the importance of giving freedom to the woman, giving her education, and giving her the incentive to get out there and put that same uh, spirit and understanding in the children. And I frankly am proud of the contribution that our women have made in the struggle for freedom. And I'm one person who's for giving them all of the leeway possible because they've made a greater contribution than many of us men. And uh, one of the best ways that they can help is to encourage the man uh, uh, try and inspire him to be more militant and turn him away from being non-violent and passive and meek and, and Uncle Tomish. Make him uh, aware uh, that the black woman wants to see her man be a man instead of around here uh, using religion as an excuse to be a coward and uh, uh, some of the things that he's been reflecting here lately. Freedom by any means necessary was the battle slogan of Malcolm X. For he knew that in America, the condition of the vast majority of the 22 million black people is very close to the condition of 11 million Africans under the fascist South African regime. He also knew of the resources of the people of African ancestry outside of Africa. Time and time again, he called on our press brothers everywhere to fight against the type of slavery which the United States 
imposes on all of us. Most people, when we say Afro-American, uh, they think only of the Negroes in the United States. But they don't realize that two-thirds of Brazil uh, are, consist of people of African blood, which means they're also Afro-American because Brazil is in South America. And in all of these, uh, many of these countries in South America and Central America, and even in Canada, uh, they are heavily populated with people whose ancestors came from Africa. So when you total up the number of Afro-Americans, real Afro-Americans, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, there are perhaps a hundred million. And if these people ever unite among themselves, not only is it necessary for the Afro-Americans in the United States to be organized, but, uh, but it's also necessary for the Afro-Americans in the Caribbean, or the, the Afro-Cubans, uh, the Afro-Brazilians. It's, it's necessary for all of them to be organized. And then once they are organized in each place, we have to organize among ourselves so that the Afro-American in the United States will be uh, working uh, in conjunction in a coordinated program with those who are in Cuba and those in Brazil and those in Venezuela and those throughout the Caribbean and Haiti and in the West Indian Islands. And in this way, we actually get strength. And it's not an accident that there's no organization existing in the Western Hemisphere that's designed toward that end. It would be, the, one of the, it would be a direct threat to imperialism as it really exists and, and to colonialism as it exists in the West. And one of the things that's going to help to bring this about is, is again, is the independence of Africa. One of the only reasons in the, uh, that we in the West have never organized, we have hated our image and our African image. And because Africa has been in the hands of people who have created an image of Africa that's negative and hateful, and uh, it has been hateful to us, we haven't wanted to identify with it. But now that Africa is getting independent and in a position to create its own image and it's a positive image, uh, those of us in the West look at the African image and see how positive it is, we begin to identify with it. We become proud of, of Africa, and we, we become proud of our African blood, our African heritage. And this is what is beginning to make the Africans in the Western Hemisphere today have, develop more race pride. And as, as this race pride develops, then it has a tendency to make us want to unite together and work together. And your Western imperialists and colonialists uh, consider this to be a grave threat more threats than uh, communism or Marxism or socialism or anything else. The Africanism is what they consider to be the real threat. Yes, undoubtedly, one of the major elements of the center of Malcolm X's revolutionary strategy is solidarity, the natural solidarity which must be restored between the Afro-American and his African brother in their common fight against a common enemy. The organization of Afro-American unity sees the only hope uh, for the black man in America uh, in a strong Africa and, and the necessity of the Afro-American becoming uh, inseparably linked with the uh, overall program that is, that's existing on the African continent. The two problems must, go, must be solved together and the two forces must go forward together. And so the organization of Afro-American unity has a program to link the Afro-Americans with the Africans and the Africans with the Afro-Americans. When I say Afro-Americans, I mean those throughout the entire Western Hemisphere. This is our only hope. Our hope is in a strong Africa. And when Africa is strong, our position in America will be one of respect. But if Africa is weak, we will never be in a position of respect in America. I, th they used to have a saying that one doesn't have a Chinaman's chance. But they don't say that anymore. They used that expression back when China was weak. But now since uh, Mao Zedong has been successful in making China a strong country, uh, uh, the Chinese have more chance than anybody else. So this thing has become outdated. Well, just as it took a strong China to give a Chinese person respect, wherever that Chinese person is found on this earth, uh, when we get a strong Africa, uh, the person of African origin or African ancestry will be respected any place on this earth, even in America but he will not be respected in America until Africa is strong, just as the Chinaman wasn't respected abroad until China became strong. He was a leader who knew that self-reliance is the only security for lasting freedom and independence. This is why he rejected the claims for white participation in the leadership of the Afro-American freedom movement. This is why he respected the example of the Chinese people in their revolutionary struggle. 
How did he view the success of China in developing nuclear weapons for her defense? Well, I think it's one of the greatest things that has ever happened because up until now, the nuclear devices have uh, been in the hands of Europeans. They've exercised a monopoly over the nuclear weapons or over the ability to produce nuclear weapons. But now the Chinese have evened it. They've equalized it by uh, uh, being successful, by being a non-white or non-European nation, and at the same time uh, de developing successfully uh, the ability to uh, produce nuclear weapons. So as far as I'm concerned, it was a very good thing, and I do hope that they are able to build bigger ones and better ones every day, because the only uh, language that the European powers understand is the language of power. And a dark nation has to be in a position to talk or speak the language that these uh, imperialists understand. And China has developed uh, the ability to be in that position and as long as she can speak the language that they understand, it's better for the other dark countries. Yes, men like this live always in the shadow of danger. He was born in white America, but his vision reaches far beyond those limits. It goes deep into the future of the black man. Today, for the first time, the black people of the West are beginning to look homeward. They're beginning to look back toward the mother continent of Africa, and they're gaining uh, spiritual strength from these roots. The African continent is on the rise, the motherland is on the rise, and our people all over the Western Hemisphere are looking back at this rising continent and the unity of that continent, and uh, it's giving us strength and hope for the future. And for the first time, not only is the black man on the African continent uh, fighting and seeking and fighting for his place in the sun, but his fight is putting the same spirit in the black people in the West, and we are also seeking and fighting for our place in the sun. And we will not rest until that place has been secured. What's your plan now? I'm going back to the uh, States first and see how my family is doing. You yes. know, got a family there. And uh, see what develops. Yes. February 21st, 1965, Brother Malcolm X fell before the bullets of assassins. His killers were those whose interests he knew would crumble before the irresistible force of worldwide revolution against racism and dollarism. Those who directed the murder of our courageous brother demonstrated their crazy belief that the ideas he fought for can be killed. They are wrong, because the voice of Malcolm X was the voice of our humanity. The words he spoke can never be silenced. They are the words and the determination of his people, a people fighting for their place in the sun, and will never rest until that place has been secured. In ...fighting for our place in the sun, and we will not rest until that place has been secured. <laughs> 